Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of Bet, North City uh, Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Monday, March 20th, 2023. It's 5 o'clock. Thank you all for being here. And I know Nick Pelzinski is joining us uh, via Zoom. He's uh, on a business trip. Nick, thanks for joining us. Our first item is that to appear on our operational agenda tomorrow night is item number five. It's the site development plan at 6125 Valley Drive that was originally on consent at our last council meeting and moved to the operational item and moved to tonight uh, as it got tabled. Uh, Community Development Director Mark Hunt, do you have a report or Jeremy? Who's Go right ahead, sir, you have the floor. Yes, Your Honor, I, I, I will kick it off if Jeremy's jump in. Uh, he's here for any questions you might have. So we have met with Mr. Hartman in my offices subsequent to our last meeting. Um, I just wanna point out to council that Mr. Hartman uh, was very apologetic and very forthright with the, if, with the work that occurred at his property. Um, he does want to put this on the right track. He um, is working with um, several licensed electricians and, and, and um, construction consultants to pull the permits that he needs to pull. Um, we did a little work in our archives and found some of the footing drawings that were really important to us to understanding where the lean-to part of the building uh, what was underneath that, and we did find that in our archives. I've shared those with Mr. Hartman, and he shared them with his uh, engineering firm who's here today. Uh, so with that, I really feel like we're on the right path at this point. There is some work to be done, no doubt. We are going to have to go through and inspect this property thoroughly to make sure the work was done within code. That will include physical inspections and perhaps opening up walls, um, perhaps doing some core work and things like that. But um, my conversation with Mr. Hartman was, was um, I think, putting us off on the right foot from here forward. So with that, I would still recommend an approval of the site development plan. Um, Mr. Peters is here to answer questions of a technical nature if you do have them. Any questions for Mark or for Jeremy? Yes, Bill. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Mark and Jeremy for all the extra work they've done on this that uh, wouldn't have to been done if uh, proper channels were gone by. Uh, I have visited with Mark and Jeremy and they are getting virtually all of the items that they asked for to make sure that the building is going to be in compliance. So this being a site development plan and not a certif certificate of occupancy that would be required prior to the occupancy of the building, I think uh, Jeremy and Mark have the tools they need to proceed forward. I will uh, be supporting the approval of this site development plan. Any other questions for Jeremy or Mark? All right, this is on operational items, so we don't have to approve it. It will come up tomorrow night. If you have questions between now and then, please call Jeremy or Mark, and they certainly can get in contact with the applicant or um, Mr. Townsend is who, here today from Townsend Engineering who represents the applicant. Any other items to, or any other discussion on this item? All right, let's move to our consent agenda items. The first one is consent agenda B. For this, we welcome our city administrator, Decker Plain, and our director of culture and recreation, Kim Kidwell, as well as the man with the money, or as much of it as we can find, our finance director, Jason Jett. Decker? Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll probably let Kim carry the ball, but um, we did submit um, a grant, uh, a CAT grant, uh, to the Iowa Department of Economic Development. And Kim and her team did that. Uh, and one of the requirements that they wanted was um, an actual resolution from us kidding, committing the $6 million that we already talked about in the budget by resolution of the council. So, Kim, do you want to carry over? And, and Jason and Kim kind of did the work last week while I was gone. Sure. Um, Your Honor, this is uh, merely a formality just to show the state that we have, the city has committed those funds uh, to the landing project. So it's more of just uh, proof that they wanna see that there's been a resolution approved by council um, for the exact six, $6 million that's committed um, from the ARPA fund. So it's just part of the application process um, and that's just upon request from, from the state. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Jason, anything else to add? I think they have summed it up nicely, Your Honor. All right. And Your Honor, we, we have requested $1 million from the state, and we had a conference call last week. Um, I thought it was a good call. Um, there's a couple other requirements that we're working on to button it up. This was one of them. Uh, so we're working through the rest of that. And 
our hope is that we'll have it all buttoned up for consideration at their first meeting in May. Um, and a typical grant, a CAT grant, has been in the neighborhood of about a half a million. Uh, when we made our original um, conversation, we said we wanted to move for a million, and uh, we think that that's still doable. Um, and we got some good comments last week to indicate that we're somewhere between probably half a million and, and a million is, is the amount that would be in the ballpark. So. Terrific. Thank you. And then we, as you know, we have the companion item for the, uh, the public hearing tomorrow night. And Brent's here if there's any other questions regarding that. Okay. So on item B, thank you for your work. We really appreciate all you're doing to push this thing forward. I'd like to uh, entertain a motion that that item remain on consent as item B. So Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, let's move to consent item P as in Paul. This is the professional service agreement with Snyder and Associates for the uh, Bet North Riverdale Rail Study. Um, Brian Schmidt is on your honor. Oh, wow, that was perfect. <laughs> what did I miss? The horn. Oh. <laughs> I wish I was paying a little more attention to the things I wasn't reading. <laughs> uh, Brian Schmidt is not with us today, and we certainly understand why. Uh, but city engineer Brent Morlock is here. Brent? Down this end tonight, Your Honor. Perfect. <laughs> Glad to see you. Um, yeah, want to give an update on that study. Uh, I did want to add in real quick, just Decker had mentioned it um, while we were talking about the landing. We do have final cost estimates in. Uh, the project is out for bids. Um, we'll bid in about three weeks. Uh, we got a pre-bid meeting coming up next week, uh, which will be very interested. You know, we'll, uh, it's mandatory for any prospective bidders. We're hoping to hear some feedback on um, schedule. It's a big one for us to see if what we've laid out is is in fact doable. It's aggressive. There's no doubt, but um, we'll, we'll I think learn a lot more at that point. But right now the numbers are uh, looking good from our estimates. So. If you remember, we had a phase one and phase two costs. So the, the phase one, obviously being the majority of splash landing, but then also there is some measure of frozen uh, that does have to get done with that work uh, while we're building all the buildings. Um, so we had a total project budget that was laid out at 21 million. Uh, you had a phase one budget of 18 uh, and a phase two budget of 3 million. Right now, our base bid estimate uh, for phase one is right at 18 million. Um, that does include, however, about a million and a half dollars of frozen money in that. So we're actually a little under on the pool, um, the, the the larger overall pool component, um, maybe a hair over on the frozen from our original split, but we still are at just under like 20.9 million um, for the overall project estimates as well. And that actually does include all of the ad alternates right now. So the alternates, if you remember, we had the discussion that we were going to bid several items that we have a little concern on where they may or may not come in at uh, namely the shade structures. You know, they're very nice metal architectural structures that we think are going to have a pretty significant uh, price tag to them. So we're bidding those as an ad alternate. There's about a million bucks in ad alternates that we have identified. That overall 21 million includes those um, as of right now. Now, obviously, we don't have to accept those. If we don't, if we want to leave ourselves, um, you know, some con extra contingency, we can, we can work through all that when we get those numbers back. But uh, Considering how quickly we moved to get this done, um, you know, I would have liked to have had these numbers maybe a couple weeks ago, but we feel really comfortable with where they're at right now. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, back to the other, second item, uh, the Riverdale study. Oh, yes, thanks. Frank. You want Frank, to ask Frank, did you have ask, something on the... Can I ask a question on yeah. that before we leave? What is your completion date or could... So we do have a com substantial completion date of the week before Memorial Day. And then final, or yeah, substantial completion actually two weeks, owner occupancy, I believe the week before, and, and even that's pushing it. You know, that's a very aggressive schedule. Um, but we heard the concerns from uh, the YMCA specifically. Um, a lot of their concerns were about being able to staff it if they couldn't get open by Memorial Day. So that is the contract. Yes, that is 2024. Thank you. <coughs> All right, let's go to consent item P. Appreciate that. Uh, so yes, the uh, Riverdale study that we have in front of you with Schneider and Associates, um, we have 
we have met with Riverdale and Schneider jointly. Uh, originally, a single agreement was put together. Uh, this, we both agreed that we should split that out. Each city should have their own piece of the agreement. Uh, we're looking at a couple things there. The big thing for us is this is going to help us evaluate the feasibility of doing something to re provide relief to the 62nd Street Court area. So if you'll remember, our original quiet zone proposal stopped at our eastern limits with Riverdale. So it basically stopped at Arconic uh, at the creek. There was no reason for us to go study 62nd Street because Riverdale had had no involvement or any discussions on that. Um, as they've progressed through, um, Riverdale now came to us and said they wanted to study a quiet zone uh, along with several other things. So part of it is just us adding in a component of 62nd Street Court and extending, that would make the quiet zone extend from 62nd Street Court on the east if everybody follows through with their plans all the way through Davenport. Uh, it'd be one consistent, uh, I don't even remember the mileage. It might have been 10 miles, 11 yeah, miles, 10 okay, six. somewhere in that right. range. Uh, so that's one item. Um, it's also going to explore the possibility of a uh, overpass at Fennel Road, um, which comes with a lot of other components. So it'll evaluate the overpass, uh, the feasibility for that, put some costs together with that. It would also uh, involve reconfiguring of local street network down in that area to then access that overpass. So that would mean a second or a, a primary way out for Arconic uh, if their other entrances were blocked. Um, it would provide us then also a possibility of, which the study will look at, of eventually looking for some funding to try to build a bridge over Crow Creek, which would connect into 62nd Street Court for us. Um, that's the main driving force of the study that, that we have in terms of you know, really our, our skin in the game is we want to evaluate what we can do for that 62nd Street area, and there is no other way out without crossing the creek and coming this way. So um, there's the, like I said, the quiet zone, there's the overpass. Uh, we're also going to look at the possibility of signalizing the intersection of uh, Fenno and State Street, which has become more of a problem uh, you know, over the last five years. We've met several times, Decker and I have, uh, with Shoveler, uh, Shoveler and Associates, um, They've been asking for years for us to do something. Now that's a DOT intersection, but uh, if we, I think if we did the overpass, we would have no choice and we would hopefully go into the state to ask for help on that as well. And, and Your Honor, if I could uh, pipe in a little bit. Sure. Um, as we met with Riverdale, the real key for us is whether or not we can provide secondary uh, or what I would call primary relief for 60 Second Street Court because when we get uh, those intersections blocked, and usually both are blocked because the distance between them is so short. Um, we have uh, pedestrian issues where some of the workers will either go through the trains or go under the train to get to Beeline or uh, any of those buildings down there. Um, and it's not on, and those are typically not CP rail trains because it's usually the drop off of either Arconic or uh, Olymp Olympic steel or those folks getting product into those areas. So it's, it's, uh, it's not the through trains, it's the, the trains that are picking up product. Uh, and they'll block for uh, 45 minutes to an hour easily. And if this could provide an opportunity for them to be able to get out, we see that as a great advantage. The study will tell us that. If, if the study says we, we can't make it work, then we would not proceed to move any further other than the study. Who are the participants in paying for the study? Be just us in the city of Riverdale. Arconic is not participating in paying for the study? At this point, they're not um, because they have to evaluate whether they can move uh, any of their personnel to that far east end, and they'll, I think they'll be studying that on their own. Um, at this point, Arconic has not come in has not been asked to come in, to, to my knowledge. We had conversations with them. And uh, Mid-American was at the table, but theirs is an in-kind contribution. Correct. We would have to get ground from them to make a connection uh, to the east. All right. Any questions of Brent for consent P? I know. Let me go here first because we always go to Bill. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so as the former Termicold property part of that study for 62nd Street Court because they've got the same situation here. The, which property? The former Termicold. I don't know if I know which one. Americold. It's on the back. Americold. Oh, Americold. Um, we'll look through the whole, the whole area and explore. Everything we're going to be looking at is 
2D for the most part, other than trying to cost out a bridge. So we'll explore some some various corridors on how we could get out through there. And, and I think one thing Decker didn't add is, you know, if we if the study does say that this is feasible, all of this is looking towards submitting to grants. You know, I, yeah. I don't think we whatsoever would think about funding anything locally other than a match if we ever had to. It would be trying to take advantage of all of this rail money, uh, grant money that's available. Uh, the first rounds of the um, grade separation program that I think we discussed during you know the, the CP negotiations as maybe looking at submitting for should be coming out here in the next month or two. So I, I think it'll be a good um, test case for us to see who was awarded what and if any of our projects such as this or 23rd Street or something that we wanted to try to submit under that program would be competitive. Okay, I think AmeriCold today, Bill, is now signalized um, at that intersection. It's not a quiet zone signalization, so it right. would require an upgrade, um, but could be easily included. But it's another property that has one way in and one way out you bet. for, you know, public safety people to be concerned about. Other questions? All right, I'd like to entertain a motion that this, go ahead. Nick, yeah, I just had a question on, on the quiet zones from, from a crossing perspective. How many crossings are we looking to include in, in this expansion to the West? So the, originally we had six or seven crossings, I think seven, um, that got us to 42nd street. And then this would just be one additional at 62nd street. So the, the quiet zone component is actually a pretty small amount of this. The majority of this is trying to study the feasibility of the overpass and then all the road connections to it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? All right. I'd entertain a motion that this remain on tomorrow night's agenda as consent item P. So moved. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll take it up tomorrow on consent. Let's move to consent Q. Professional services agreement with Veenster and Kim. Uh, Brent Morlock, please. City engineer. Another project. Uh, this is another project that has been a long time in the making and going to be very happy to, to get this done. Um, I think as you're all aware, Severe Steel on 33rd Street has a long history of flooding uh, during high rainfall events. Um, unfortunately, the, the age of the facility and the storm sewer infrastructure there just can't handle all the water that's being funneled down there. Uh, you've got I think when we looked, maybe 80-some acres that's coming off that hillside and running right down on 33rd, and uh, you got a 12- and a 15-inch pipe that meanders its way through their entire plant before it eventually gets to the river. So um, they have submitted, I think we showed three, three and a half million dollars in uh, insurance claims over the last, I think that was just the last 10 years. Uh, so two, two and a half years ago, uh, we met with them. They actually took the proactive step and hired, uh, actually hired VNK to do an initial feasibility study uh, on some options, put some cost to it, and came to us asking if, if we'd either fund it or uh, go look for grants for the project. So we evaluated it, um, spoke with our reps at Iowa Homeland, and you know, there was a lot of hazard mitigation money out there at that time and thought we qualified well for it. Uh, it took about two years to actually get through the process between FEMA and Iowa Homeland, but we were awarded, uh, I think it was about 617000 for the project. That include, And it's actually 100% funding, so that's no city money involved at all right now. Um, they changed all their thresholds. It's a 90% federal and 10% state match and nothing from the city. Uh, that includes this uh, contracted dollar amount, so that's the preliminary and final engineering, and we're also going to have them do the construction inspection just so they can handle all the, the federal paperwork. Uh, but they're ready to get surveyed, get this thing going. Uh, we did solicit for um, uh, consultants through an RFP process that is required since it is federal money. Uh, only got three um, submittals and VNK having the, the historical knowledge uh, of the project was the strongest firm. So we've cleared all those, uh, um, all those approvals through Iowa Homeland and ready to get the project going. Questions for Brent? Thank you, sir. I'd like to entertain a motion that this remain on tomorrow night's agenda as consent item Q. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Your Honor, if we uh, are successful and get this done, we should make sure that Dave Loebsack gets invited to the ribbon cutting because this started with Dave Loebsack, I think, eight, 
yeah. eight years ago, I think. Um, after you and I, Jeff, went down and met with him and got this thing started. So and, thank you for your work there, and, too. And Brent has worked his tail off on, you, on this issue with Homeland Security. So it's been a long process. I mean, it's been a I long time. about right. I think it entered in the, uh, the Scott County's uh, hazard mitigation plan eight or ten years ago, I think, is when exactly. it actually showed up. Your Honor, I just add, I just shared with Brent, I, because of this work being done, there's a potential for a nice expansion at another building and facility down there that's not severe. But because this work is being done, there's another industrial partner that's looking at a pretty substantial expansion because now they do not have any sort of stormwater issues that they were anticipating being there. So this is a good thing in a lot of regards. And because of the conversations that we've had with the CP, um, they've been pretty uh, helpful so far, and we're hoping we'll get a little more help from them as part of the project. Yeah, we will need their concurrence. Basically, we're going to build a new storm sewer system to try to catch that water before it gets to Sevier and then pipe it over to 35th Street where we can take it right to our stormwater basin down there. But we will have to do a lot of work in <coughs> CP's rail uh, in right away. Um, so we will need their cooperation, and hopefully the relationships we've built will help that. Perfect. Good. Thank you. We'll take it up tomorrow night as uh, consent Q. We move to consent R. This is a resolution from our human resources director, Kathleen Richland. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Currently, Elixir, uh, formerly known as Medtrax RX, is providing the pharmacy benefits to the employees. Uh, pharmacy benefits are considered a subset of the city's overall insurance plan. Holmes Murphy, the city's insurance broker, has reviewed the Elixir pharmacy benefit contract with staff and in reviewing the current Elixir contract, as well as analyzing the types of prescription that are utilized on the plan, Holmes Murphy does believe that additional extensive rebates and lower costs could be provided by other pharmacy benefit managers. The city's insurance plan year is from July 1 through June 30th every year. And in order to have the uh, enough time to review other pharmacy benefit managers and potentially go in another direction by July 1 of 2023, staff would need to um, notify Elixir within 90 days, and that is in line with our plan year. Therefore, staff is requesting approval to provide notice to Elixir and explore alternate opportunities with pharmacy benefit uh, managers. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Kathleen. Best of luck. Thank you for your work. Thank you. This is consent R. I'd like to entertain a motion that would remain the same for tomorrow night's consideration. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll take that up as consent R. Are there any other consent agenda items on tomorrow night's agenda? Any particular council member would like to ask questions about or discuss at this time? Yes, Jerry. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to uh, note that on a couple of construction projects, I was pleased to see that uh, the bids came in below our, our uh, engineer's estimates. Uh, it means that uh, construction I think firms are now uh, getting think a little hungry. Um, we're, I think we've said this before. We're never going to get back to the pricing that we lost <coughs> oh, no. a couple years ago, but I think our new baseline is back to a couple, two or 3% a year, not the 20, 25% that we're seeing. And we had one... Thoris Grove phase four, which obviously we know we've talked about a lot in the budget and the, the impacts that project has. I came in almost $700,000 under the estimate. So some really good aggressive pricing. Fantastic. Any other consent agenda items anybody <laughs> you'd like to discuss? All right, let's uh, entertain approval of the remaining consent agenda items. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I don't have any items to be added. Any council member? Yes. Greg. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we were talking about the rail project, and I got to thinking about what happened in Ohio, Ohio, with the derailment. And I know many, many moons ago when I was uh, operations officer, uh, we had a plan. <coughs> we had to uh, abandon this building. How would we do it? And is that, do we have a plan now? Is it current? Um, could somebody look into it and get back get back to us? Yeah, we can get back to you. All right. 
Because if we don't, we, we need to have something because we'd have to move the, all the services to. I think we used to do we was Davenport, wasn't it? We'd go to Davenport. Some of our it's stuff. a combination now. I mean, of yeah. who would go where? We'd have to go to. With dispatch being where it's located now, that's that a, a lot better. Yeah. yeah. And we'd probably have to share with Public Works and all of our other facilities. Yeah. Um, dispatch was the big deal. The other thing is uh, IT infrastructure. Yeah. So. So anyway, just something I think we yeah, need to certainly need very to important. Review. We don't have a plan, and everybody's aware of it. <clears throat> It's like practicing getting out of here, which you do that every once in a while. Yes, sir. All right. Jerry has a Thank question. you, Your Honor. Jerry, go ahead. A, a follow up on that. Uh, I assume our fire department has, is prepared for an emergency plan, if uh, hazmat, whatever, if we had uh, uh, a derailment like they had in Ohio? Yes, we have. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, worked with our Mavis partners and have a combined hazardous materials team. So we do have other resources and our own personnel to handle those types of situations. And, handle those. And, and as part of our local emergency planning council initiative, there's uh, there's a separate CP rail. Um, I, I can't a cares group. I think it's called. Um, and somebody's going to have to help me with that acronym, but there's a group that uh, with the CP, they have other resources regionally here uh, and regionally to be able to come in uh, from their perspective as well. So that group meets regularly as part of the local emergency planning council. Thank you. Hey, Decker, uh, Adams. During, during those meetings with, with CP, are they reviewing uh, or sharing with the communities what uh, type of materials are passing through um, on the rails at any given time? Are there, is there a list that we would be provided to, um, to our first responders in an effort to um, shorten the, you know, the, the time it would take to understand uh, the situation? Are they providing any of that, any of that information to, um, to us as the, you know, as a city where they're passing through? Steve, you want to answer? Uh, they don't specifically provide us that information, but we do, We've been allowed uh, to use applications, apps on our phones that uh, will tell us what uh, materials are on each uh, rail car when a train goes through. But we have to identify the particular train and the particular car in order to do that. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that's an area of opportunity because, uh, you know, it's very similar to you know, and identifying an airplane flying overhead, you can do that if you, you know, the, you know, the tail number, but if, if there's a, a major incident on the railroad, um, you know, I don't know that that's going to be, you know, some of that information may not be accessible to us as quickly as we need. Um, so certainly something we may want to address with them on how to better understand what's passing through our community at any given time. Your Honor, I, I do know that part of the, uh, this is, of course would be, regulated at a, at a federal level. Uh, and so any interstate commerce um, like this would really, we wouldn't be able to, to mandate that ourselves. But I do believe that that issue of, of which, of when a city would be notified of what sorts of materials are coming through is being looked at and maybe the thresholds are, are being lowered. Um, right now, I believe it's based on the number of of cars in a particular train that might have a particular substance. So I think it's, those are issues that are being looked at at a federal level. So good. It's, good. it's a good point though that, that Nick brings up. Yeah, keep us posted on what we can do if we need to lobby and who we need to lobby. Any other items for council this evening? All right, let's move to our presentation on the budget. <coughs> I like seeing you, Jason. My trepidation is not with you. <laughs> It's with what you are going to share. <laughs> well, and you'll notice that uh, tonight's presentation is printed on legal because uh, just as this budget process is stretched on, so it's the uh, size of the budget. Well played, my friend. <laughs> Will you be sharing that for the screen for so Nick can see it? Um, can I do that from here? There you go. Okay, perfect. Yes, you can. Yep, I can see it now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, the FY23-24 budget uh, 
soldiers on. Um, we've endured some changes throughout, as you're all well aware. Um, and we have uh, sent publication of our first public hearing to the Quad City Times. That was published, or will be published, this week uh, for the public hearing to be held on April 4th. The hearing is only about uh, the maximum dollars levied by the city. Uh, it doesn't hold us to a budget. It doesn't hold us to that maximum dollar as long as we don't exceed it. Um, so that uh, process is underway. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about version three of the budget. Uh, we talked a little bit about this two weeks ago. In total, that budget totals $111 million. Uh, that includes transfers and internal service funds. Uh, $95 million net of those internal service funds and transfers. And the reason we net that out is because you're kind of double counting um, expenditures when you look at internals and transfers. Uh, so really, $95 million has not changed since version two of the budget, but the $111 million was $116 million in the previous version of the budget. The reason for that is uh, we're, we're recommending combining levies so we don't need to transfer from the employee benefits fund into the general fund like we normally do. So it just eliminates that transfer, which uh, eliminates about $5 million from the total budget. So tonight we'll talk about version three of the budget again. Some of those requests that we have found funding sources for uh, impact of tax and fee changes and uh, this will be a decision point for us tonight. We'll need some direction from council on how to proceed with the levy rate. Um, we're going to talk about proposed property tax legislation still coming our way at the state level and how combining levy rates that we currently use today might be helpful for us going forward. Uh, and that'll also bring up a decision point for council. And then we'll talk finally about the remaining budget calendar. Um, as you know, we'll have to have this budget for this year only adopted by April 30th instead of March 31st. So in version three of the budget, um, you'll recall that it, version two kind of stripped away some expenditures to uh, accommodate that loss of taxable value due, due to the change in the rollback uh, that kind of happened in the middle of our budget process. Um, we heard council's desires to try to get some of those expenditures back in the budget and funded uh, in a couple of different ways. So we have put in uh, those code enforcement uh, positions, or one code enforcement position, uh, and also taken away a seasonal code enforcement position to kind of help offset that cost. Mm -hmm. We put in an extra position in the planning area. We put in some staff upgrades at library, uh, but uh, cut into that cost by reducing the library materials budget by about 18500 So in total, we've added about $158,000 to version three over version two. Jason, before you move on real quick on the library materials, I assume that's a one time for next year. It wouldn't continue to fund the library staff changes moving forward. It, Correct. It's to get it there for next year, and then you have to work your magic yet again. Right. Okay. Yep. Jason. And the planning person was not in the original budget, but was a request of council to take a look at. That's correct. Okay. Frank. Your Honor. Not, did Your we Honor. not add a person in public works? Um, we are uh, adding in sanitation. Uh, I left that out of this uh, discussion because it's in the enterprise fund and doesn't affect the tax rate, uh, but that position is still funded in the budget, yes. Go ahead, Nick. <coughs> Nick, did you have something? I, I think it was me, Your Honor. I think, oh. it, was, I think it was me down here. Okay. <laughs> just, Mark. just, 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 just. To... <laughs> Nick's, n Nick's gonna look around going, was that me? We got you, Nick, you're okay, nothing. Right, just Mark? A, a small clarification, it's, it's a plan reviewer, not a city planner. Um, similar words, different jobs. Okay. Uh, in the building department. <coughs> Thank you for that. Go ahead, Jason, I appreciate it. I just, since we were there, I just wanted to make sure we were clear. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, so we've added about $158,000 to version three over version two. Uh, the way we have funded that over on the right-hand side, um, Mark has identified several license and permit fees that we're probably a little bit behind on increasing, and we can generate about $58,500 in revenue there, all in the general fund. Uh, we'll also increase uh, connection fees in the sewer fund, but again, that's in an enterprise fund and doesn't necessarily affect the tax rate here for this discussion. Uh, in order to get that plan review position in, we would recommend the increase of the levy rate by about a nickel. 
uh, that generates a nickel is worth about $137,000 annually. However, um, between version two and version three, uh, taxable value, as you'll as you'll know, was estimated for version two because we didn't have that final <coughs> uh, rollback number until recently. Uh, so the actual taxable value after that was finalized came in just slightly less than what we estimated. So it wiped away about thirty-eight thousand dollars of tax revenue. Um, so there you have you're at one hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars of revenue offsetting those additional expenditures, and that is how we would recommend funding those. What that does to the levy rate, as you work your way across this table, you'll see uh, FY23 is in the first column. Uh, moving over to FY24 version three, if we were to keep our levies split apart like we do today, and you can see how those change. In the general fund, it would be going from 573 to 578. Uh, work your way down, and you can see that the total levy would move from 1265 to 1270. Later in the presentation, we'll talk about uh, why we would recommend combining all of those various levies outside of the debt service levy up into the general fund for a total of 785 there. Uh, not changing the total levy rate, that'll remain 1270, uh, but there's some advantageous reasons to do that uh, for future years. And we're do, we would recommend that to maximize potential growth in future years. Um, additional levying capacity today under current law is about $11 million of taxes that uh, the city could ask for, but that we are not asking for. Um, if uh, Senate Study Bill 1124, which has a new number now, uh, would pass, that 11 million would be cut to about 7 million in, new, in capacity to raise taxes. I think it's Senate file 356, I think. That's correct. How does that nickel increase change uh, property taxes on our average home and our average commercial property? Um, as you know, the mean value for 2022 assessments was 272,723. Uh, this was a non-assessment year. So as you work your way across this table, we're gonna look at the three factors that kind of calculate that tax bill. The first being assessed value. In a non-assessment year, uh, for the most part, residential assessments on individual properties don't change. Uh, the impact of the rollback will increase the tax bill on that home by about $18. And then the impact of our levy rate change from 1265 to 1270 would increase taxes an additional seven for a total of a $25 or 1% increase in taxes on that average home. Per month or per year? That is per year. Thank you. Yep. On the average commercial, we're looking at just a little bit over a million dollar in property value. Again, no property value change there, so that factor didn't change taxes. Uh, the impact of the state's changes to the rollback and, and how uh, taxes on commercial properties calculated will wipe away about $670 of taxes from that tax bill uh, last year. Um, and then our levy rate change from 1265 to 1270 would add back just $43. So they would still have about uh, $627 less tax bill for FY24 than they do in 23. That's a decrease of 5% on the commercial side. And just remind us, even though we may know the answer, you have the ability to affect the rate for all property. You can't pick and choose categories of property. Correct. So if you were to say, boy, that commercial stuff, maybe we just raise taxes there, that's not an option. Not an option. Okay. That's absolutely right. <coughs> now we'll talk a, a little bit about those enterprise funds that I've kind of... Uh, uh, left alone so far today just to talk about how the impact of the tax increase and increases in fees would affect these these properties. Um, so as you work your way across the table, you've got residential versus commercial. And then downward, uh, we start with the property taxes. Just like on the previous page, you'll see that's going up about 25 bucks on a residential property and down about 627 on the commercial property. Our sewer increases, uh, which we will have a third reading on the increases for enterprise funds tomorrow night. Uh, a 15 cent increase on sewer rates will increase the bill on a residential property by about $13 a year. Stormwater is about $2.40 per year. And then solid waste fees going up 3% is an increase of $6.36 per year. 
36 cents per year for a total of $47 uh, in increased fees and taxes on that average home in FY24. That's up just 1.9% over last year. And I would point out, we think that's, that's pretty good in, a, in an environment where the city's facing the same inflation as everyone, uh, a six to 8% on, on supplies and services. On the commercial side, uh, they're usually heavier users of sewer and stormwater, so those uh, annual increases are $34 for sewer, uh, just shy of $30 for stormwater. Uh, with the big tax decrease, uh, their annual costs of kind of operating their property will be about 506, or decreased by about $563 for the year, uh, down about 4.2% in total. Here's the charts that we're all very familiar with. Um, just as a point of review, this is current year uh, statistics on these charts. So we're talking about FY22, 23 taxes and user fees on that average home. If we were to place that $272,000 home at, in any of these 21 Iowa cities, uh, this is what their tax bills and their enterprise fund uh, utility fees would look like and add up to. <coughs> Um, the average being about $2,866 a year. Uh, this year, Bettendorf's cost uh, on that home is $2,447, so uh, about $400 less than average. And obviously, they're in the bottom uh, half, bottom third of total cost uh, when you're looking at the 21 cities with populations of 24,000 or more across the state. So we feel like we compare pretty favorably and provide a pretty good value uh, for residents of Bettendorf. And we do that through lean operations. If we stripped away the debt levy from that tax calculation and just looked at the operating levy and the user fees, uh, Bettendorf is the lowest of those 21 cities in cost on the average home at 1,754. Um, but as we know, uh, a big portion of uh, the city's tax, uh, tax levy rate is the debt service rate. And, uh, that kind of moves us up the scale towards the middle on that previous chart. Did we have a change in our operations chart from the chart we put together for State of the City where we were number two? I don't believe so. I we were number two behind Ames. Okay. I'll have to look. I really like being number one better, so <laughs> whatever that change is, let's double check it so I Maybe feel we good did it about alphabetic that and screwed up. next year. <laughs> <laughs> I think we that were, was a proposal. We were, we were number two behind Ames on the general fund levy rate. Okay. I uh, do know that. Yeah, that may be what we were talking about. Well, anytime you can get me a number one slide, I like it better. <laughs> Let's just do this. One. There it is, Your Honor. <laughs> All right. Signed, sealed, delivered. So that uh, does bring us to a decision point. Um, one. Uh, Shall we increase those license and permit fees that we talked about at the top? Uh, likely, we'd make that effective July 1. And again, this would be an ordinance change. So just like our utility rates would require three readings, so we put that in front of you uh, with enough time to get that uh, done for an effective uh, July 1 date. Uh, and that those uh, increases would be to fund the upgrades in code enforcement and planning. Um, and then finally, Increase the levy rate five cents from 1265 to 1270 to fund that one full time plan reviewer uh, in community development uh, planning division. Jason, can you remind us, or maybe Mark, Jeremy, Brent, uh, with the proposed increase in license and permit fees, we become more competitive with our counterparts. We were relatively low. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we probably should be taking advantage of because it's fair based on our comparisons. We're not at the top. We were close to the bottom. We're kind of mid-range at this point. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I did have a memo I sent to council probably I remember the back memo. in February. And so um, how I would describe that is we will still be among the lowest Um but we're gonna be more competitive. I think that's a great word. And then we're also be more consistent with ourself. For example, we had um, for a temporary heat, I, I may have this slightly, the, the example's gonna make sense. The words might not be great. We have for a temporary heat permit, it was $25. 
let's say, but then for a temporary gas permit or a temporary electrical permit, it was zero dollars. Well, they're both the same amount of work. For some reason, we weren't consistent with ourselves. So there's some consistency changes we're going to make just to be consistent, and there's some increases we're going to make to keep up with inflation and be competitive still. And the downside of this is what? Other than you may get some blowback, but the blowback, if we're still low, shouldn't be... You yeah, know, reasonable blowback is one thing, but it's still kind of unreasonable if we're raising rates for those services that we're providing and we're still low in comparison. Yes, I think we'll we'll use discretion. We are not going to try and nickel dime our developers. They are our lifeblood, and we appreciate them. Uh, but we will use discretion in charging these fees. Okay. After my clarification, anybody want to speak on these two decision point items? Craig, anything? No, sir. Lisa. Frank had brought up during our discussion with, with the Hartman thing um, about the, what, $75 fine for not following the process. Would this be a spot or another non-budget thing as far as bringing it up to maybe change that? Because we were talking about how low that was. I see Decker. Is that something we've considered? Yeah, I, I, don't know that it's, I don't know that it's particular here. Mark can answer that. But I think um, reviewing all of those is appropriate, uh, particularly in light of both this and that, um, just to be a little more consistent. And I don't know if Mark has a comment on that, but I think these these permit fees, um, if if they need to be adjusted, I would just say this, and, and Bill might chime in. Um, in my 32 years of doing this, um, this is maybe the second occasion where this is occurred where it got to this level. So I don't know that being, certainly from a revenue standpoint, it's not even relevant. But from a punitive standpoint, um, I think you sent a really strong message when you did this. And I think that's the more important part of that. So I don't know that changing those fees is, it, they should be looked at as a matter of course, to your exactly. point. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but but from a revenue standpoint, it certainly doesn't have the effect oh, yeah. like the other license and permit fees. Yeah, but I was but just you're right. Timing, so. Yeah, you're you're correct. Bill, anything to add? Well, I would just say that uh, I don't believe we had any increases in permit fees when I started, and subsequent to that, uh, at that point in time, the cost of a single family home was about. $105 a square foot. It's at least three times that now. So I think to keep pace with the market, I don't think it's a stretch for us to raise our rates a little bit so we're still on the low end of the spectrum. Uh, and as far as the uh, additional help in the community development department, if, uh, if we can keep permits moving through the system and out the door, it could translate anywhere from maybe three to $10 million more in tactical valuation every year if we can keep the cycle moving. So I think the nickel is a good investment on our part. Scott, anything to add? No, Your Honor, just grateful that licensing and permit fees still appears to be under local control. Grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I see what you did there. I do. Nice. Jerry. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm on board with uh, Jason's recommendation. I, I, I recommend we move forward with it. And, and I want to make a comment about our inspections and our permits. They're for public safety. I mean, we're, we're making sure that that's a uh, home or business or a commercial building that's constructed is, is safe for occupancy. And so this isn't just a matter of collecting fees. This is uh, adding value. Frank? I'll go along with what's been proposed. Nick, anything? Thank you, Your Honor. No, I, I'm, I'm in line with keeping the uh, the permit fee structure in sort of in alignment with where everything's headed from a from a cost structure. Um, you know, I've still been still been thinking pretty hard on the on the increase to the levy um, and just wanting to understand if there's other, there's other 
means from you know potential grants or opportunities from the state that we might be able to leverage uh, instead of instead of looking at increasing um, the levy by a nickel at this point. But um, certainly more you know more research being done on that. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. I share your concern, especially in an election year. I'm I'm never happy to raise taxes, and I hope it isn't something that comes back to, to bite us. I also am a little concerned that we, at our level, decided the plan reviewer was a good idea when that wasn't in the budget or even in the budget requests. But if it's needed, to Bill's point, certainly that has been an area where um, we get some significant feedback, good and bad, depending on you know what it is, um, from our developers because we have built some good relationships there uh, for the most part, for the ones who build here uh, more than others. And um, there have been comments about getting building permits. Uh, never have I heard comments about fees, so I'm 100% I'm on board there. I just, I wonder if we're looking for a, a, a way to solve a problem that either doesn't exist or putting a person there uh, for a nickel that isn't needed if it wasn't in the budget request. But I understand where you all stand at this point. Based on comments, anybody have anything else to add? Jason, what else do you need from us? All right. Uh, one more uh, decision or, or direction uh, from council tonight is um, whether or not we combine those separate levies that we have traditionally used, uh, the general fund, <coughs> transit, risk and liability insurance, uh, health insurance, and then the, the police and fire pension levies. We could combine all of those under the general fund. Uh, and the reason we might do that is because of some state legislation that we're keeping an eye on, uh, namely the Senate File 356, uh, formerly Senate Study Bill 1124. Uh, this eliminates several levies available to cities, none of which the city, the city of Bettendorf currently uses. So that's, that's good for us. But it severely limits growth and property tax revenue by reducing the general fund levy rate to a point that growth, and this gets confusing, reduces the general fund levy rate to a point that growth in taxable valuation is effectively limited to 2.5% or 3.25%. Now, Bettendorf would fall into the 3.25% category because our general fund levy is less than 810. Those that are at 810 or over fall in the 2.5% category. Another piece of legislation, uh, probably just if not more concerning, is Senate File 550, uh, formerly Senate Study Bill 1125. This actually increases the sales tax rate and local distributions, which sounds great, but it reduces the commercial rollback from 90% to 80% and replaces current tax credits, like the Homestead Credit, by increasing amounts exempted from property tax with no state replacement. Today, uh, cities are reimbursed for that homestead credit. Uh, they're reimbursed for the military uh, service credit, uh, things like that. Uh, Senate File 550 changes how those are calculated, um, actually increases them, uh, but rather than providing them as a credit, uh, they just exempt it from property tax altogether. So that would be a, a pretty steep reduction in <coughs> property tax revenue for cities. So we're kind of keeping our eye on this as we wrap up the budget uh, over the next month. Um, but I want to talk about that Senate File 356 specifically because this one seems like it probably has uh, the best chance for uh, passage at this point. And the case for combining levies, uh, which Bettendorf is in a, in a unique position to be able to do this. Um, I don't really like busy PowerPoint slides, but there's no better way, <laughs> no better way to, to illustrate this point. Um, the obviously first column is our, our description column. The next column to the right is our FY24 levies as they're split right now, uh, as they're split today under current law. Um, the general fund levy rate right here. Oops, let me go back. Um, just shy of 578, as we talked about. That generates about $15.9 million. That's with the nickel, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> it generates about
about $15.9 million in property taxes. That's an increase over last year of $656,000. Then we come down to our other levies that are available to cities and will remain available after the passage of this, of this bill, as it's written today. Uh, those levies give us about $5.7 million. In total, uh, the city at 785, this, so net of the debt service levy, we're gonna kind of ignore that one for right now. Uh, at 785 gets us about $21.6 million or 824,000 more than last year. It's just an increase of 3.96%. That's current law, how our budget is currently um, kind of constructed. If you go over to the next column, if Senate file 356 were in place for the budget we're working on, that's, that, those limitations were in place. Um, our, what they would call our base general fund levy is what it was last year, 572. But by limiting the growth in taxable value to 3.25%, they effectively reduce your general fund levy rate to make sure that that growth is 3.25%. So that would reduce our 572 to 554. We would have no control over that whatsoever. That would generate about 15.2 million in taxes, just 7,491 more than last year. That doesn't buy much. Thankfully, we do still have these levies available to us down here for another 5.7 million, but our total levy rate under Senate file 356 would automatically be reduced to 761 uh, or just our property tax dollars under that situation would go up by just 175,849 or less than 1%. So that would be a real challenge uh, to any city, but um, thankfully uh, we have some flexibility and that's what the third column here illustrates, why we would combine levies so say we had combined levies last year at 780, and that was our base general fund levy rate. Our change in value would force the le that levy down to 755, <clears throat> and we would, oh, darn it. I think I've never done this before. Uh, but that would generate only $10,000 more than the same 780 levy the previous year. Um, Thankfully, we can come back now in this next section to these other levies available to us. And I would probably just, in this example, start out by putting 29 cents in employee health to get us $814,000. That gets us back up to 785 and back up to the same 21.6 million that we have under the split levy. That's kind of the case for why you would do it. Um, and let the next slide will show you how this change will look over the next six years. And the, count, the row I want to point out to you is this budget year limited general fund levy rate row. This is what's happening with 4% growth in taxable value. 785 becomes 760, becomes 736, becomes 713. By FY30, we're down to $6.47 with no mechanism to increase that levy whatsoever. Thankfully, as the law is written right now, these levies down below are still available to us, transit, tort, uh, police and fire pension, employee health. So as that's, that general fund levy rate is being reduced, we can come back and add in as needed to those other levy rates to keep this levy rate at 785 and keep relatively modest growth in property tax dollars. Uh, despite the reduction up above. If we were at 810 uh, and had been using these levies, uh, we would not have that flexibility. And that's the position many, many, many cities will be in across the state. So very fortunate to be in the position we are. Um, we've heard this before. It was only two years ago, I think, that we combined levies to kind of counteract some, some legislation that was pending at that time and that didn't come to be. Um, so we can always go back to the old way uh, if, if this does not come to be. But um, I think uh, the case is pretty strong for doing it. We want it, we want the growth off the biggest number possible. And to do that, uh, we need to combine our current levies into the general fund levy um, with really no bearing on the total <coughs> levy other than 
you know, the, the increase of a nickel that we've, we've already talked about. Yeah, the next couple of pages I won't uh, dive into too much. It's, it's the general fund summary that I show you during our budget talks uh, under the uh, SF-356. Uh, so you can kind of see where property tax dollars, property tax rates would go with modest increases in expenditures here and, and maintaining a general fund balance of around 25%. Um, this is where I say, you know, down the line, if this legislation were to pass and this is our situation, um, we will eventually, you'll eventually cap what you can collect in those other levies. So this, this certainly will eventually hurt us worse than it does in the early years. Um, but I think what we need to probably stop talking about is the levy rate and talk more about uh, the tax dollars levied in total and how that is changing by percentage or by dollars. Um, but the levy rate will probably have to flex up and down as we're kind of <coughs> finding our way through this. Um, but I think if we talk about it in terms of tax dollars and how those are increasing compared to previous years, um, we'll be able to soften that uh, message a little bit. So finally, uh, a decision point here is, uh, do we have council's uh, approval to kind of combine all of those levy rates into the general fund at 785 uh, or, um, and, and try to get as much allowable growth for future years as we can under that pending legislation. My hope is this, this legislation, you know, doesn't make a funnel and, and we're, we're good to survive another year, but uh, I think we need to at least kind of plan, uh, plan for the worst, uh, hope for the best at this point. I think it's the same as we talked about two years ago. If this is a strategic play, we can always decouple like we like to explain the budget. But um, Nick, we'll start with you and we'll go back from right to left. Uh, no questions right now, Your Honor. Thank you. Frank? No questions. Jerry? I support combining the levies. Scott? Thank you, Your Honor. I don't have anything to add, though. All right. Bill? I'm an I. Lisa? I'm an I, and then, as long as we can be couple like you were saying, Bob. So. We'll always track what you're spending, you know, what those levies go to. Yeah. Yeah. Bill? <coughs> or Greg, um, whichever you want to be today. <laughs> both with black sweaters, both with <laughs> shirts on underneath. Looking good. Both, both very good. handsome. Both good. Very handsome. handsome. One with Best hair. Best shape of your one life. Hair. hair and one not. Yeah. I'm supportive. Well, he could be Lisa. Your Honor, I would just <laughs> I would, uh, support that. Your Honor. I would just add that um, several of the cities. Well, there's only four um, of us. So all four of us. Well, there's there's actually some cities that can uh, have some of the ability to do this, and they've all they're all doing the same thing. Well, uh, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Yep. Okay, boy. Uh, Jason, it's it's just been a lot of fun with you this year. <laughs> I look forward to. Taking Have you a break slept at all in three months? <laughs> uh, it looks good. Occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the remaining budget calendar, we sent notice of the max levy hearing to the paper last Friday to be published this week. Um, for that public hearing that will be held on April fourth, um, the next public hearing uh, isn't. Uh, necessary until April 18th at the regular council meeting, but could be uh, delayed if we deem it necessary to push that, uh, but it could be delayed as late as April 28th. However, I do need to get notice of that public hearing to the Quad City Times by May 31st. So um, that's kind of our, that May 31st is kind of our deadline for final, final budget decisions, but I think we have pretty good direction here tonight. Um, so I will proceed uh, with the calendar and expected adoption on April 18th. And we will keep our eyes on developments at the state uh, between now and then. And that is all I have for you, Your Honor. Well, thank you, Jason. We appreciate all your hard work and the hard work of your staff, as well as the department heads who've worked hard to kind of shoehorn a, a a really good budget into something smaller. 
with all of the challenges presented by our friends from the state. Any further questions for Jason before we let him off the hook? <laughs> all right, then I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We stand adjourned. Good work, everybody. We can usually have a turn. Yeah. Two, Jason. Yeah.